Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello again. Welcome back to the show. Now, this week we are joined by author and documentary consultant Steve Darlow, who has just finished working on the fantastic new Lancaster documentary that's out now. Uh, Steve, welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I mean, start with the obvious question, really, but how did you get involved in the, in the documentary? Uh, well, I was actually um, I was up at uh, Coningsby, home, home to the, the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. Um, I was doing something with, with a veteran up there. And... Uh, Whilst I was up there, the guys um, who made Spitfire, which uh, the, the film that, that came before Lancaster, they were doing some filming for, for Spitfire, and I, you know, just got talking to them and uh, and said about the follow up and an obvious follow up uh, was was going to be Lancaster. You know, we're in mm-hmm. the hangar up at Coningsby, and you've got all the Spitfires there, but uh, there's the big bird as well. So we needed to do something with Lancaster. So. Um, we exchanged contact details, and obviously they were still still working with the with Spitfire. And then, um, as and when, um, we, we we started to get involved with Lancaster. And I went to the premiere of, of Spitfire um, in in London, and uh, fantastic occasion. And was very impressed with the approach directors David Fairhead and Anthony Palmer um, had put uh, their approach with regard to Spitfire. Um, and I thought if they can do the same thing with, with Lancaster, very, very, very veteran focused, outstanding aerial photography you know, yeah. and, and combining that sort of thing, then, then I'd love to love to work with them. I've worked on a, a few documentaries, but this one certainly had a different sort of feel, which hopefully you've seen and, and, and noticed yourself uh, has come across. So, and, and I've, for well, 20 odd years now, I've been researching and writing about Bomber Command. My, my grandfather was a Lancaster pilot. He flew, he flew on Halifax's mm-hmm. first, and then he became a Pathfinder and, and 405 Squadron. Um, so uh, I had an affinity to, to Bomber Command and to the, the Lancaster story anyway. So, so yeah, so they, the, then they started work on Lancaster, and I got more and more involved with it. Oh, it's brilliant. It's, um, Certainly comes through in the production. Like we, me and Matt were, we thought the production values were top notch. You know, starting off with that incredible aerial sequence. Is it Lake Vern where they shot that at? Um, uh, the, uh, the Derwent, uh, the Lancaster flying over the Derwent. Right. Yeah. yeah it's you know. it's incredible. Like we we were just amazed. We thought it was CG. Like uh, when we first looked, and then we were like, no, hang on, that's that's real. Like wow, it's just such a powerful introduction to the to the show to the the film. Absolutely. Yeah, I thought yeah. Chris. I thought Chris Rose's um, score was perfect for that sequence. Yeah, um, it really just powerful. came across as very emotive, and it got across the the sheer power and 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 I suppose majesty of the Lancaster as it was flying over that lake. Absolutely, and I mean, Chris's treatment of of the Lancaster story because I'm sure we're going to get onto this is a different it's a different story to the Spitfire story. But mm, Chris's treatment obviously. of Lancaster. Yeah. Um, he, he really has brought it across, and um, he, th- then he's actually just released the soundtrack. Actually, you can now download that, and uh, I, I, I was listening to it on Spotify the other day, and it really captures the emotion and and, and the mood mm. and the moral ambiguity and the tension mm. um, that's, that's associated with the Lancaster. But yes, that that opening sequence where they're, they're flying over the dome, because of course the brilliant area aerial photographer John Dibbs has oh, been yeah. able to. To work his his magic again, it's not easy to say this, but sort of when, when the the pandemic hit, um, it's sort of a silver lining if there can be one with the pandemic, okay. in the regard that um, the Lancaster, the BBMS Lancaster, wasn't doing air shows. All the mm, air shows were cancelled, yeah. but they still needed to get their their air hours in uh, frame. So um, they were willing to work with the, the production team. Um, and do these training runs and, and give John and and, um, Ant and and David the opportunity to get some of this this wonderful wonderful footage, and yeah. then the, you know the creation of the set, the, the, the post production work as well. That's that's gone into. I saw an early edit, but the post production 
it's a team of producers who and and directors whose attention to detail i i think is mm. is, is phenomenal and uh, there's so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes they really do need to do a making of at some yeah, point yeah that'd be that'd because be really there's so much detail um, I, one of the things that struck me about the film was uh, the the really really impressive editing the way that they combined um contemporary footage stuff from film um that amazing aerial photography certain certain points where they included some effects like the flames illustrating the you know the, the beginning of the discussion of dresden all those things coming together it, it, it just created something that's more special than your average documentary i thought it it, it certainly lifted it into another yeah. another tier mm. absolutely i think um I don't think this is hyperbole to say, but I think David and Ant's, Ant's genius is is a lot to do with the editing because there's a terrific amount of footage. There's fifty plus hours of veteran interviews wow, in the wow. can, um, and the first uh, the first edit I I saw of the film um, was three and a half hours long. Oh my! Which you can't go with because well, it's it, just short of two hours now, now, isn't it? In the final, exactly. Yeah. Now so, uh, but their editing and the way the way the story has been crafted. Um, I think I think it's a. I'm going to say it because I'm involved with it, but I think it's an exceptional piece of work. <laughs> yeah, it really. No, I think it. I think it really is. It's great for you know, even if if you're an aficionado on Bomber Command or the Lancaster, you can appreciate it. If you're a complete newbie to the to the history world, you'll you'll get things from it too because it's not just about you know how many rivets or how many bolts are on a Lancaster. It it also goes into personal stories which which just hit a beat for everybody. You know, it, it's, you know, everyone was touched by the second world war. It says it in the, in the documentary itself. So I just think that's really special. You've got a, there's a really good mix of the technical and the the personal, which I think some documentaries sometimes miss perhaps, but I just think yeah. it's great. Um, so for you personally, I, I was wondering what was the hardest part for you while making the documentary? Is there any challenges you faced? Well, I think, um, Quite early on, um, we had a lot of discussions about uh, the the tone of the, of the film. Um, it, it's going to it was always going to be different to Spitfire because Spitfire is about Spitfire is a defender of the realm, defender of the nation. Mm. It's there's a, the heroic aspect. To yeah, it. there's much less ambiguity to it, isn't there? It, it, absolutely. So there, there's a um, the moral ambiguity. Uh, there's less of it, precisely. Yeah, it's defense you go into, over attack. If you think it maybe that's right. So the Spitfire has defended the country in the you know, in the hurricane but it, during the Battle of Britain. Now, the country's going on the offensive, um, and it's going to get uh, the, the levels of, of violence uh, are going to going to escalate. So the tone needed a, a lot of thinking about, and um, D- D- David Anton and I you know, we exchanged a lot. We had a lot of Zoom meetings. We had a lot, a lot of conversations about the tone. And I would, I would say there was some create. There was um, early on. There was there was some creative tension in there, but not in a bad way. Mm. There was created as we tried to work out how you were going to present um, the, the the moral a- ambiguity. I mean, I've got, I, I've been steeped in the story of Bomber Command for 20, 20 plus years now. And I do get frustrated with the presentation of, of Bomber Command, um, certainly in the media, where you've got two minutes and they'll they'll cut straight to Dresden. Mm-hmm. And Dresden is is at the end of the is in in February 1945. There's so much more to Bomber Command. Um, tens of thousands of men had lost their lives in other campaigns you know, yeah. pre- previously to that. So it was a frustration that it that it went to that. However, as you were just alluding to earlier, Robbie, when you're presenting this doc- documentary, um, you've, you've almost got to try and cater for two audiences. You, you're catering for the people who are familiar with the story. Um, and then you, you need, hopefully, and it's it's uh, an ambition for this, uh, this film, that it does bring in a whole new audience of people who want to know more about Bomber Command and the story of Bomber. And David and, and Anthony were, were excellent in, in trying to find that balance. I think... Distribution companies are going to buy the film. Sky have got the film. They're going to they're going to show it later. They're going to put pressure on that they want to see in the film Dan Busters mm. and Dresden. Yeah, they're going to want that in there. Uh, if you want commercial backing, if you want the funding, you've got to start looking at that because 
because they can do that. But yet you don't want to overemphasize that because there's so much to the story. So there was a lot of discussion early on trying to get uh, to get that um, that that balance in there. And I think the treatment um, that they've come up with it, it's not a it's not a film about I'd say it's not a film about facts, as you say. It's not about nuts, bolts, and, and rivets. It's about the story of the Lancaster. So the human yeah. associations that are connected with it, the people's lives that it's affected, both on both sides, both in Germany uh, and and in this country and around the world, because it was very early on. We had a lot of discussion. We needed a Canadian voice. We needed the Australian voice. We needed yeah. the, the Kiwi voice as well. And we managed to get in touch with veterans um, all, all across the world. Um, so that was I one question I was going to ask. You, I was going to yeah. ask, how did you bring together that group of veterans to, to talk about that? Obviously, you had that connection through your father. And, you know, I, I assume that you through your work previously you, you've been interacted with lots of veterans but what were the how, how did you pull that group together when it covers so many different aspects of bomber command well it was sorry it was my my grandfather was was the pilot but he sorry, went missing sir. that's right he went missing in 1947 so i didn't i didn't know him but over the over the years 25 years now of research and writing books um i've met and interviewed a lot of veterans I, you know, you probably corresponded and met. You're probably getting up to about 200 plus wow. uh, specific bomb friends. So, <laughs> I think David and Anthony were quite impressed when we first had sort of had a Zoom, and they were saying, "Well, th- this veteran, this veteran." So I said, "Okay." So I, I got my black book out. So, for example, Joe Lancaster's in the film. So Joe, okay. And and while we're chatting, like like we're chatting now, I'd pick the phone up. Hi, Joe. How are you? Talking to these guys who are putting a film. Would you like? Would you? Would you like to get involved? Yeah, that's okay. Because hopefully it's not bragging, but I published Joe's book. So yeah. I've built up a relationship with these guys so that they they trust me. And if I'm saying, mm-hmm. please course, get involved yeah. in this documentary, and they trust me. So I, I knew a lot of the, the British veterans. I knew um, uh, I had Canadian contacts. So, for example, a gentleman called Dean Black, who's involved with the association in Canada, he brought a load of Canadians over in 2012 for the opening of the Bomber Command Memorial. I knew Dean, contacted Dean, said, look, we'd like to get a Canadian uh, voices. So he knew certain veterans and put in touch. We could get them filmed. I had, I knew the 75 New Zealand Squadron Glen uh, Association out in New Zealand. So they were able to put us in touch with the New Zealander. So we could bring, we could get these veterans in. But the, the one of the main issues, of course, is when we started this, this was pre-pandemic. Yeah. And when you know, I said to David and Anthony when we first met, for obvious reasons, we need to get the veteran interviews done as soon as possible. And indeed, you know, lots of the guys you see, see saw when you watched the film are no, no longer with us. So the emphasis was get get those interviews as as, as quickly as we can uh, around um, around the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, David and David and Anthony, they're very. You know, I sat in on quite a lot of the interviews. They're very good at the interviewing. I, I did one, <laughs> and I learned a lot from them. One thing I thought, one particular thing I noticed was that they're, they're, um, the, the silence, the way they used silence. So they would ask a mm. question of a veteran who would answer, yeah. and then pause, and then wait, because often that's when you'll get the gem uh, yeah. that comes out that, that follows on with that. So just give, give these veterans time to think. And, um, and come up with their answers. Now, through your documentary, you're saying there's 50 hours of footage. How much of those interviews weren't used? So maybe future documentary makers or future generations can benefit from these interviews, seeing as some of these chaps unfortunately passed on. Like it's really, it's also something that might come out of the documentary as well. I think it's really important, and that's a nice thing. I think. Yes, and that's a discussion that needs to be had. That's what's going to happen to the archive. Mm. Um, of these interviews now i mean the, the editing has been very difficult because i think everything's a gem i'm the historian i think everything yeah. is a gem but these guys have got to bring they've got to get it down to to the story so yeah they have a the, narrative some, down there. exactly and some of the, the veterans unfortunately they, they couldn't even even make make the final cut right um but, uh, yeah, but what more could be done with it? You know, I, I think at some point it's, it's good quality stuff. Um, and it's, it's historically valuable. 
Yeah, I think it's and it's also really nice. You saying you've got the you got the Canadian, you've got the Australian, the Kiwi. It's it's nice to hear them all have different accents coming from different cultures, different backgrounds, but they have this shared experience. I think it's something that really comes through. It it it's almost to me like they like they could have all been in the same Lancaster together. I think it was really interesting just to hear the bits of picked out and just little things like them choosing their own crews. Like me and Matt were astounded yeah. at that. We were like, did this happen? Like we're not RAF experts at all, but like we were just astounded about some of the things you get from this documentary. I think that's one of the great things about it that you'll be saying it's not going niche, but if, if you never knew anything about the RAF, just that little bit there alone, it's just such it's gold. I think it's so good. Yeah, absolutely. That story, and we've, and we've got the, the, a Scottish voice in, in there there as well. But yes, mm-hmm. to bring in bring in that variety, and as you say, you know, putting the crew together. They, I don't think I'm giving spoilers here, but you know, they no. put them in a they put them in a hangar and uh, are basically tell them to get on sort it out themselves. It's just a mm-hmm. wonderful way of working. Yeah, it's working great. out um, uh, how to do it, and just to, just in in regard the, the choice of the veterans as well. It was quite quite a the decision was made quite early on. That we wouldn't leave it exclusively to Lancaster veterans because there is a common experience through Bomber mm. Command. So, yeah. and if you're te- and also if you're telling the story of the Lancaster, you need to tell the story of how you got to the Lancaster. Of course, so you need to tell you need crews to talk about nuclear and Wellingtons and Hamdens and some of the, some of the earlier aircraft um, before you get to that. And just the other, if I can go on the other aspect of, of making sure including the other crews. Um, as well is that the Lancaster is a machine, but it's also a symbol. It's symbolic, and of course, there's a, it's it's the only four-engine heavy that's flying. Well, there's another Lancaster flying in Canada, but there's no Halifax flying, and there isn't um, a Sterling flying as well. And the plaque on the Lancaster commemorates the fifty-five thousand five hundred seventy-three men who died with Bomber Command. So that's not just Lancaster crews; mm. that's guys who who flew in all the aircraft types. And the and the Lancaster is iconic. I remember um, a year or so ago, I was at, was actually in a church and came across a display that was talking about icons and the definition of an icon being a window into a kingdom. Well, mm-hmm. the Lancaster is our window. It's the symbol. It's the icon into the kingdom of Bomber Command. Yeah. So the guys who crewed up for Halifaxes had the same experience as the guys who crewed up for the Lancasters. So the Lancaster is our canvas. It's our window. It's the platform where we can tell those human stories. Not just of the air crew as well. We we bring in some very poignant um, counts from from the women who served with Bomber yeah. Command, or or a new air crew who served with um, with Bomber Command as well. So very early on, this is, we're not just leaving it to Lancaster crews. This is mm. just as in the Spitfire film, they have they talk about the Hurricane as well. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, it's good and also to see some footage of like Afro Manchesters and things. It's not something that we were expecting to see, but it really enriches the, the viewing experience. Hello there. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Me and Matt really like the fact that you used uh, clips from the Dam Busters and Target for Tonight and uh, is it Journeys? Oh, I can't remember that. Uh, Journey Together, I think it's 45. Journey yeah. Together. Yeah, we thought that was great because it's th- those for obviously us, we're, we're a film, war film podcast, obviously, but that for us is such a such a touchstone as well. Like when people think of Lancaster, they might they think Dam Busters or maybe Target for Tonight, maybe, maybe as a few niche, <laughs> few film fans that think of that one. It's quite niche, but... I think it was really nice to have that in there um, because it's it's such a just iconic piece of Lancaster like iconography. We think of the Lancaster, we thought it was great. Another thing we loved was the color footage of Guy Gibson, then going to the footage of Richard Todd. We were just we knew yeah. he looked like him, but we were shocked at how uncanny <laughs> Todd looks like Guy Gibson. It's just a a very small thing, but whose idea was that to include those? Was it just obvious, or did you have to? You want it in somehow. Well, I think David, uh, that, that was probably outside of that is was outside of my remit. I mean, I looked at archive film sure. of Bomber Command Raids and that sort of thing, but drawing on um Target for tonight and, and the Dam Busters, I think that, that's a call that's been made by 
mm. by David and Anthony, but they have a period feel about them, don't they? they yeah, they that, do. That, that they take you into that period. Yeah, um, they really and do. they're such such beautifully well done. Um, mm. And then you can you know you got the, you can contrast those young men with the veterans that that we've got got now, of course. Um, and they they provide some provide some excellent link, links within within the the narrative. Um, that needs to be told. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. But, I mean, the one th- other thing that astounded us and me and Matt were in the, we were watching it on Amazon Watch Party together and we were in the chat box and every time we saw these Bomber Command instructional film comes up, we were like, oh, another one, great, amazing. We've ne- we just don't think we've seen another documentary that has this much of no, that kind the, of footage in it. It's the variety of, of archival footage and contemporary footage was was really something, especially the colour stuff. Mm. Um that was that was really really striking. I think this is again <laughs> picking up David and Anthony and the producers because the producers are allowing you know they're backing this and, and making it happen. Is that their attention to detail and their willingness to explore every every avenue um, to arrive at what they arrive at um, does make it stand out. And that attention to detail does uh, does pay off in the end. I mean the the bomb the operational footage, for example, it's it's quite. And then you know, you, uh, you add Chris Rose music to that. You add the sound of the yeah. Merlin engines. It all it all builds up and makes it a, a all the sensations are getting involved um, involved with. And there was colorization of some of that bomber command operational mm-hmm. research um, footage because it's, it's black and white. But obviously, you know, in, a, yeah. in a bombing rage, the target indicators that mm-hmm. get dropped um, they're going to be reds and greens and yellows. Um, mm. So it, so it gives you a feel with that. I mean, there's, there's other little bits of detail that I think are fantastic in the film that I can mention if you want. You want sure, to. absolutely, of course. But just think, I, David, um, it, it applies to the sound. This so David's got uh, an exhaust of a Lancaster, and, uh, and if you tap the exhaust, you get you know, a ting, ting, ting. So, so they sampled that sound, and then throughout the film, they're using that sound. So there's a sequence where window the um, the anti yeah, the, the yeah, radar stuff. Yeah. So that's that's come from the thinking on a on a Lancaster the actual oh, Lancaster wow. Lancaster's oh, exhaust. Wow. So you've that got, really is attention to detail. Yeah, yeah that's great. Absolutely. And this is where this is where I think they need to do a making of. And um, the uh, the choir there's, there's the, the beautiful choir piece that that comes in at the end. That was recorded in the Farnborough wind tunnel. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah I noticed it was on the on the credits there. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing! Wow. So, so that's that, I, I, that that's what lifts it, I I think to yeah. uh, to another level. I think it Just does. That, that, that feeling for, mm. for it. Yeah, it does evoke like a like a sort of, sort of like a sense of pride almost. Like that's our bomber. Like that's our history and our cultural connection to the, the Second World War. I think it's it's great, and it's another thing where. You know, me and Matt say it all the time. You have to keep making these movies, and you have to keep making them as best they can be because it, it is unfortunately we're going to get to a stage where we won't have any veterans to talk to, but we can go back to things like this and we can remember it and we can preserve it. So to have something so well produced as this is, it's another just another great thing for people to be able to go and watch. Yeah, and and, and one of the the early decisions prompted by what Johnny Johnson says in the film, which I'll let people watch that and say that is that it's we, it's the veterans speaking. So there's no mm. his, there's no historians coming yeah, in of course. And giving their, no, no talking their, heads, etc. No, yeah. no talking. So apart from you've got Charles um, Charles Dance giving the narration to give mm. to give context, uh, and then uh, uh, I think it's Seb, isn't it? It's at the end, talking about the battle bit. But it's it's the veterans talking. And that's where, again, that's where the editing is very good because you've got so many people talking and yet the storyline still flows. Mm. And mm. I mean, every interview was transcribed and then they've worked at pulling it around and moving bits out to, to make sure that we get that um, yeah. that narrative going in. But yes, it, it's only the veterans um, doing the talking, which I, I think makes it, yeah, it's makes very it all, the, all the better. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there anything from that narrative that you would have liked to have seen included because you obviously got those 50 hours plus of of veterans giving their stories and thoughts and you know sharing emotions is there anything in there that as great as it is 
and it, the narrative works brilliantly. It, it expresses clearly what it wants to get across. Do you think it, anything would have added to that if if, you, if they'd had a little bit more time to play and insert other little aspects? I think there's there's two answers to that. <laughs> there's the answer. I'm not saying that I'm a filmmaker because I'm the consultant on this mm-hmm. and, a, and a co-producer. But so I think the filmmaker, not probably not because it's a nicely rounded story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, within a nice time frame, but as a historian and some who wants to tell the story of Bomber Command, I'd sure. stick another hour on it. I'd, <laughs> yeah, I'd talk about uh, the Battle of the Barges and Bomber Command in the during the Battle of Britain. I'd talk about Bomber Command against the V weapons. I'd go more on about Normandy attacking the Tirpitz. Uh, after the war, there was Operation Manor when Lancasters were dropping food to the starving Dutch. Operation mm-hmm. Exodus, where they were bringing home the prisoners. Well, so you, 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 you've you opened one up there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should have this, 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 you know, this and this. But, well, they, but of course, that's it, it can't be that. Um, yeah, because, of course. Because it's not, It's just, as I said before, it's not a list of facts. It's a story. And although yeah. in, in the envelope of, of Bomber Command, which is a, a difficult subject matter, the, the, the film still needs to entertain and you've got to, and therefore you, you've got to retain attention. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it is entertaining. It's um, it's a, it's a special, it's a special sort of entertainment where because it's obviously you're talking about real experiences and, and real history. You're not, it's not someone's imagined script of characters. It's real people. So I think it, the way it's treated, it's a certain type of entertainment, but it's a very hard hitting and poignant one. You want to move the audience on a, an emotional level, intellectually as well, but you want to move them emotionally as well. And I think that's what they've, um, I think that's what they've achieved with this. Um, mm. I mean, there's, there's lots of other emo- emotional stuff. That, there's a thing called LMF, lack of moral fibre. Mm-hmm. Um, crews used to get labelled if they refused to fly, go on operations. So there's, there's lots of veteran testimony uh, with that as well. But again, that just had, that, that, yeah. that had to, that had to, had to come out but it does it, it, it's very difficult to say you want it to entertain because it's about bombing it's it's killing mm, the lancaster yeah. is a machine that was designed to carry the offensive and it, and it killed people so you, the word entertain needs to be qualified in that in that it moves it moves you emotionally yeah mm, because yeah. a certain type of entertainment it, it's all yes. it's hard to think of the word right now but you know i know what you're getting out there engaging but, i'd say more it needs to be engaging engaging that's the one i thought the human aspect of it was really well handled i thought not only were you getting across the 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 young age of the guys when they were joining the RAF you know um i like the the subtle nods and uh, and coy hints at, you know the the um, coming of age, let's say, uh, and those aspects of things, which are, you know, it gives it a real human flavour of these these men were going off on exceptionally difficult missions, doing a horrendous job, and and that description of um, of the flak really struck me as well. Um, the smell of cordite and you know the, the flashes and the chap that said near the end that you know even even when he, he closes his eyes now and goes to sleep, he still sees flak explosions and the and the, the flashes of, of flak. Yeah. But it doesn't bother him because he's learned to live with it. I just thought all of those little anecdotes and 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 memories really gave it a a, a flavor that you don't get with run-of-the-mill documentaries because it just it just seemed the material was handled in such a deft way that it really brought all of those emotions and it made you think, which is always what gives that engagement that we were talking about. It's when you think on a human level, you know, that's, that's when audiences really engage. And these were, the, the, as you say, these were lads 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It makes you think, what would I have done that at, at yeah. that age as well? I mean, <clears throat> but the, the questioning of the veterans in the interviews, you know, there's a lot of preparation work because, um, I, I know, I know what the veterans. And I've interviewed enough of them and written. Enough, I know what they can say. So you've got to get a set of questions together that try and get that, 
get that from them. You know, you don't want to mm. ask them yes or no questions. You need to prompt them to talk about the stuff that you just, just said and to take them back to those days where they can uh, rem- remember um, what they experienced. And a, a lot of it, the re- remembering, you've got to be careful with remembering and, and memories. Um, you now, one of the one of my jobs was to go through. We, we interview the veterans, and if everything that's been in there, I would have fact checked against documents and records and logbooks, and made sure that it's historically. Yeah, that's essential, isn't it? Because it's eighty years. Memory can can you know change and, and play tricks and that exactly. sort of thing, can't it? It can, and you and, and you have to check. I mean, probably sometimes you go into the archives, and even the archives can dis- one, one document can yeah. disagree with another document because uh, someone's written it wrong or whatever. But with 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 the accuracy is in respect of the fact. But I think this documentary also brings out the memory of the feelings that they had at that, mm. that particular time, um, the fear, the smell of fear, the feeling of fear. Mm. Uh, but then we go into romance as well, the romances that they had. You know these 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 young lads, all yeah. humanising, and what they had to. And it was a very unusual war. You could be over Germany at twenty thousand feet. You're not seeing the effect of what you're doing in respect of bombing. It's at night. It's twenty thousand feet below, you. and then you're coming back to to try and get get back into some kind of um, normality. Yeah. And there was no there was nothing to help any of these guys with. Um, PTSD no. it's never, it'd never been no. done before on that scale had it? It, it you know it's completely a new experience for anyone i thought mm. i thought the story of um uh, the young lady that was was seeing a, a member of the bomber crew and she phoned they phoned each other before every mission you know and there was a cutoff point where he, you know they could contact one another and she didn't manage to make it and that was the the day he didn't come back i thought that was really affecting that was and that's one of those instances where they hold there's a silence after she's spoken yeah yeah and you just watch her thinking and you know as the audience are looking through her eyes there's been some nice follow-up to that and that's wendy um in that we've, we've been desperately trying to trace the relatives of the, the young man we were talking about and oh, wow. um wow. and we have uh and, fi- and found the school that he went to but his so we found a, a i think he says half sister's niece or great niece, and they didn't really know a lot about him. And this mm. poor lad was going was going to be forgotten and never, never thought of again. And um, you know, if I can, if, I, if I'm allowed to say, it, it's one of the rewarding aspects of this kind of thing is it, we've now brought him to life again a little bit. And Wendy, Wendy's remembering him, and and the family that didn't know much about him, they're going to be uh, remembering remembering him as well and um I mean, she she came to the premiere and she sent us some some fantastic letters as, as saying how much she she enjoyed it oh, yeah that, that, that sequence doesn't matter how many times i see that sequence i start blubbing pretty much <laughs> mm, very powerful it was yeah very i mean so wow maybe that's a great time to close i mean we don't want to give away too much if you haven't seen the the documentary matt is there anything else you'd like to add no, I think we covered a lot of ground there in, in a short space of time. I found that absolutely fascinating. Is there anything you'd like to add, Stephen? I don't know if there's anything we haven't covered that you'd like to. No, I, I don't think so. Um, fingers crossed we've, we've already started on the next one. Um, oh, fantastic. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, that's as much as I'm going to tell you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, we'll definitely keep our eyes out for that then. Yeah, we will. Definitely. Just to remind everyone listening, you can catch Lancaster at your local theatre. It's got a theatrical run. It's on DVD and it's on video on demand. So you've got no excuse not to see it. And again, thanks for Stephen for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook and at fightingonfilm.com where you can find the entire back catalogue of the podcast. Catch you next week, everybody. Bye, everyone.